Hey guys, welcome to another tutorial. In this particular video, we are going to talk about a very specific photo editing software made for Sigma cameras called Sigma Photo Pro. Now, the Sigma Photo Pro is amazing piece of software if you're particularly using Sigma cameras, any Sigma cameras. I'm a big fan of the Sigma cameras. They tend to give one of the most superior image quality I've ever seen in any digital camera, period. Anyway, so in this video, I'm going to show you how to use it if you don't know how. Now, before I jump into the tutorial, there's a couple of things to mention. First of all, please do like and subscribe. That would be really, really helpful. Second, because due to the current situation, a lot of people are working from home. So you might hear some kind of disturbing noise, which I try to avoid as much as I can. But my humble apology in advance. Now, let's jump into the tutorial right away. Now, this is how the software looks like the interface, not very traditional look. I'm going to get into it how now to navigate to your photos, you can go directly from your folder. So you don't know, you don't really need to import. It can work directly from your USB or hard drive, which is pretty awesome. And I personally like it a lot. Now on the top, you have a basic tools, file, edit, view, help. Now you can directly convert tip and JPEG, but of course you are here to edit. So you're gonna, we're going to edit first, right? Now, in order to look at the information, you have to click on the photo or as many photos as you're probably going to have in your folder, click it, then you're going to have all this immediately ready to look at. Now, if you click I, of course, you're going to look at the exif information, which is pretty useful. Now, slideshow, pretty easy. Like you, if you have a lot of photos, you can click all the photos and click play and it's going to show you the slideshow. And this is to change the orientation. If you if your photo is not straight enough, a black and white, you can tag them. But I don't really tend to use them because of course you're going to have to edit the photo first, right? In order to edit the photo, you have to go to the far right. And then you have two options, review images and review images in a separate new window. Now we are going, Click either of them, doesn't really matter. Don't overthink it. I'm going to start with this one, review images. Now it's immediately going to open a new window, which is where you're going to edit your photos. Good thing is that like, it's like a mix of Lightroom and Photoshop, meaning that it works like Lightroom, but when you're going to edit a photo, you have to edit the photo individually. Now, some people might find it in convenient, obviously you want to batch process, but if you want to have your ultimate control like Photoshop does, this is how you're going to edit. Now, immediately you're going to see the window and a lot more knobs and buttons. So I'm going to start from the far right. Now far right, we have our histogram. And at the bottom, you have the navigation and the information. What information does, when you're going to move the cursor around, you're going to see the change in X, Y, and RGB values, obviously. Now, again on top, now you have one extra button called adjustment. And then adjustment, we're not going to look at that. What we're going to look at, you still have the JPEG and TIFF. You have the I to ch check the information. There you go. Then you have print. Of course, I mean, this is the least used button, I think in any photo editing software. Now to change your orientation, the rotation buttons, you have them available and you have the delete button. Now here, interestingly, you have G1, G2, G3. What happened is that they are more like a preset, preset for quality. I don't overthink and, you know, don't think about it too much. I just jump right into the editing. In order to edit, I recommend you to either stay in XC, X3F or custom. What happened is that the XCF is going to show you the photo were taken at the time with the settings were available inside your camera. Just like the default in-camera settings. It's going to bring in all here. You also have the same button here, so which is very convenient. Now you have the auto, when you click auto, what happened, it's just going to add some, the preset, trying to judge the photos and trying to figure out 
what should be the best option more like an auto button this is more like an automatic and you have custom now custom obviously this is where you want to do so you can either pick either custom or you can either pick xc x3f we're going to stay in x3f now before i jump into the editing department i'm going to just quickly take you through how it works if you want to edit color you have the color tab right there can you see it there you go or you can click monochrome and it's going to turn into monochrome first like that and then you can modify your monochrome photo from there right so i'm going to start with the color first because this is where majority people are going to work in however let me tell you i love monochrome if i were you i would start with the monochrome first because that's just uh, i love monochrome that's it anyway jumping in now we are in the color we are in either custom or x3f don't worry about it don't sweat it too much you can edit your photo and save the settings what happened next time if you want to apply exact same settings you can apply the settings clicking in the list right now you have the original when you save it you would have your settings available in the list pretty convenient now in the detail section you have smooth to crispy now by default it's in the middle it's somewhat in between so that's your preset let's say it's almost like a sharpening setting now we're going to stay in the middle but if you click in each direction it's going to show you the details for example right now it's showing me detail adjust detail expression for the whole image set it towards crispy to accentuate detailed rendering or toward smooth to make it make the expression smoother you know depends personally a uh, rule of thumb is if you are shooting portrait generally you should always keep it to smooth if you are shooting architecture or landscape obviously you want it to be a bit more sharper in that case crispy then again remember if you have a high iso noise and high iso photo generally speaking you still want to stay in between smooth and the middle don't want to go to crispy because it's going to show a lot of noises now from there i'm just going to get rid of this button it's annoying me a lot i'm going to show you exactly what it does tone adjustment i mean i'm about 99.99 percent sure you know what they are you have the exposure contrast shadow highlight saturation sharpness fill light now this is an interesting one the fill light so what fill light is how would i show you right now now exposure if you go 0.1 minus it reduces the exposure obviously what happens when you do the same with the fill light so i'm gonna go reduction so if you clearly see it shows the detail the fill light the fill light slider affects the tone correction by adding extra light energy into the shadow region without overexposing the highlight clearly it explains a lot so fill light basically adds light without clipping your let's say the cloud because cloud are the most widest region of this photo so it's going to add lights without blowing out your highlights which is pretty freaking awesome now here this is the interesting part this button right there what happens what is this imagine you have a photograph with a gray card so you can click this one and let's say this region of the sky it's similar to the gray card and you want to set this as your middle gray i'm going to click it what happens now so what it, it did it set it this region of the cloud as a middle gray and everything else changed so you can use that if you have a gray card inside your photograph i'm just going to click reset to bring it back over exposure correction what it is how about i click it there you go do you see what happened so what it did exactly it's simple let's say you actually have a region pretty freaking overexposed let's say again could be the cloud in this case this is a perfect image but what if your sky or anything is way overexposed when you click it it automatically try to reduce your overexposed area and try to recover some highlights again pretty amazing automatic mode you can always do that in any other software but having this kind of tools is very convenient so i'm going to unclick it 
Now you have white balance. Now white balance, you have a bunch of preset. You have the daylight, shade, overcast, uh, fluorescent. You get the point. I'm just going to try the automatic version just to just to see what it does. You know, it did a very good job. Look at the histogram. Everything is kind of aligned, red, green, and blue. That means that it did a good job. So they have two automatic version. One, just automatic. Second one, the lighting source priority. So essentially what it means that imagine that you have a photograph when the light's coming from various sources. So this try to fix that problem without um, going nuts, which is very good. Now I'm going to go down and you have the bunch of preset, the color picture style. If you are familiar with the Canon and Nikon or Fuji film simulation, pretty much the similar. Now here is interesting, but I'm going to get into each of them. So you have the standard, obviously. Now the Vivid, what Vivid does. So I'm imagining Vivid going to make it saturated while pretty crunchy. And then you can, this slider, you can either reduce the effect or make it even stronger. Now, neutral, I'm imagining that it's going to make it mute, like, you know, not too overdone. Yep, exactly. Then you have the portrait, obviously, the name gives it away. It's for um, anybody with the people inside the photograph. Landscape. I always wonder what is the big difference between the landscape and the vivid because vivid is originally means that you want to make it vibrant, bright, crunchy, contrast-free, saturated. Then you have landscape, right? And to me, I mean, I know that the landscape ideally want to uh, push your red and sky blue and the green a little more than the vivid. That being said, I mean, it's still quite weird, personally to me, to having to have uh, e both of them individually. Now, you have the cinema look. So if I click it, what it does, it's going to give you a film look that you would watch in the movie. There you go. To me, it's not much different than, let's say, the 70s uh, film or Quentin Tarantino movie or Safia. Then you have the teal and orange i tried it last time this is freaking amazing watch out three two one boom you see that amazing isn't it this this is the perfect example of a good teal and orange i've seen many other examples they are like way overdone disgusting no detail this one on the other hand it's just smooth man and then you have the sunset red now sunset red is of course it pushes the red a little bit more you can check the histogram. It says the mid-tone. In the mid-tone, you have the red a little bit up. And then you have the forest green. Of course, this is not a forest here. But if you had a forest, this would push the green a little bit more than usual. I would imagine. Exactly. This is what it exactly did. Uh, you have the FOV classic blue. Let's see what it does. Mm, uh, you know, it, it, it punched the blue a little bit more than I would imagine. You know, uh, not bad. To be honest, the classic yellow, again, the name gives it away. I think it's going to push the yellow more than everything else. Yep, that's what exactly did. Kind of like a, uh, you know, it reminds me of Kodachrome. Then you are back to original. Then you have the color adjustment. If you are using any camera in the planet, in your camera settings, you have exactly something similar. Sometimes it's square, sometimes it's round. You know, you can use this particular tool again and drop it where you have pure white, not pure gray, pure white. Let's say the sky and then we'll try to get rid of all the color cast. Let's see what it does here. Uh, three, two, one. There you go. So what it did, it made the white pure white. This is a phenomenal piece of tool for any kind of photography. So it tried to get rid of any kind of color cast from your photo. It is not essentially exactly same as white balance. It's something different. It's more about the color cast than the white balance itself. For the white balance, you have the other tool right there. And then, of course, my favorite tone curve. So good thing is that every time you put your cursor on the line, it shows where you're touching. And here's another part. If you're not very comfortable with your tone curve, for instance, like, you know, you don't know, you're not really sure, 
about uh, touching this line what you can do you can click that see that I click shadow there's a change I click the darkness it changed again there I click the light here and I click the highlight it's at the top what it means let's say you're not very comfortable you can at least use this one and the slider will do the job for you so you are safe there my friend which is pretty amazing I don't know why the Adobe or any other famous softwares don't do that I know silky Pix does it but not exactly the same let's say the light light darkness if I click the darkness do you see that it changed there automatically so you don't need to worry too much and good thing about the slider you don't overdo it like if I wanted to do by myself I could just push the hell out of it like no tomorrow but it doesn't it stops you from overdoing anything that's useful because a lot of us have a very bad habit of overdoing instead of doing it now let me get to another point before I go down here you see you have exposure contrast shadow highlight like a four slider for controlling your tone and light then you have a fill light again then you have a button if you have a gray card to click on the gray card to fix the overexposure you have the overexposure correction automatic so you have one two three four a five six seven already in this section now this is not just the end and then you have a tone curve which is the king of any kind of uh, tone control with either manual uh, tone control or the sliders and then here at the bottom you have the highlight control this is <laughs> I mean you can do anything you want when it comes to light so what it does highlight color control it controls the highlight color so here's the thing imagine you such did a lot of saturation because remember every time you control your saturation saturation also um, clip your highlights let me show you an example I'm going to boost the saturation like no tomorrow see what happened there it the, 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 the everything exploded the channel of the light exploded now you want to restore some of the highlight right keep an eye on the histogram so I'm gonna go all the way to the restore so it tried to control a little bit good news is that it's not showing any kind of change because the photo is not oversaturated but if I go all the way to the neutralized it kind of tried to push it back again the photo is phenomenal so it didn't do much of a change which is a good news so this is a good thing about capturing a photo perfectly at the very beginning you don't need to do too much work in photo editing software you can just shoot publish move on anyway moving on then you have the noise reduction so you have the default noise reduction chroma and luminance you know that already right I am sure that you do then you have the chromatic aberration generally the sigma lenses are perfect so you don't need to worry too much about it then you have the lens profile again if you click it you try to fix the lens if you have a third party lenses for your sigma camera I highly doubt it though then you have the fringe correction let's say you have a highly saturated bright sunny day time to time if the lens is not perfect enough you're gonna have like a edges at the corner I'm gonna zoom in quite a bit just to show you exactly there you go and check this out if you click it here you don't necessarily have to zoom all the way you can just zoom to here and then it's just gonna show you the edges like that did you see that now that is a definition convenience period 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 I can actually look at my photo without having to zoom in all the time and all my edges look perfectly fine no chromatic aberration no any kind of weird fringe so that's just perfect now about if you have the problem you have the option to set it finally you have the ghosting color reduction I have zero idea what it does but I'm gonna click it to check ghosting color reduction it reduces the ghosting color so generally if I understand correctly if you have if you're photographing against a bright light source you try to reduce any kind of flare now we're gonna move into the monochrome 
So I'm not gonna show you each and every of them. I'm just gonna show you the difference. So generally there's not much of a difference except your tone control. What it does, obviously monochrome is monochrome. So clearly it took away your saturation because there is no color in monochrome, right? Then you have the color mixer. Now color mixer, do you remember back in the day when you take uh, black and white uh, photography in the film and then people used to put like a red filter or blue filter or green filter or yellow filter right at the front? This is the exact same effect. Right now, I move the, this is in the middle, right? At the very middle. Now this is the neutral black and white. Now, if you want to make the sky really strong, I suggest you to take it in the in the red and then see what happens. Wait for it, wait for it, and boom. You see, it made the sky a bit more punchy, strong, and beautiful. Now, this is brilliant. And same goes for it changes the look when you move it to green. And it, it would imagine the same effect if you uh, move it to blue. You see, this is brilliant. And I love it. Now you have it, you have the tone curve. I already showed you how, what it does. And everything else pretty much remain the same, except here you have a film grain. So I'm gonna zoom in this time, one on one. And I'm going to add a little bit of film grain. Let's see what happens. So I'm gonna add a little bit. Let's say I, I, I'm gonna go crazy on this. And then add the roughness. Let's say a pretty strong film grain here. Do you see that? Pretty amazing, isn't it? And it added adds a little bit of a like a pretty sweet film look, a film grain on your photograph, like back in the day. Now I'm gonna go back to 25%. Let's see what it does. There you go. It looks like that old film photography. Now again, anything else different here? The noise reduction remains the same. You don't have the chroma noise, but you have the luminance part. Of course, because the chroma is color and this is not a color photo. So the, your chroma won't work. Now at the bottom, you have the shading effect. So I'm gonna turn on. Shading effect, I'm imagining that this could be, what do you call it? The vignette, maybe I'm wrong. I'm gonna say reducing the peripheral, reducing the peripheral emulsion can highlight the central area of the image, exactly. So this is the shading effect is vignette, as a matter of fact. So you can add the radius and you can add the amount if you like based on your tone. Now in black and white, you have the traditional black and white, then you have plenty of others. Red, warm tone, sepia, green, blue, green, blue, cold tone and blue, purple. I'm gonna go with the cold tone. Let's see what it does. Let's see what it gives me. Yeah, I quite like it, you know? And if you have your own choices, you have this little circle, you can move it around and add as many as you like. You see that? It's pretty cool actually. So I'm gonna go to the yellow, let's see what it does. I think it's gonna give me a safer look. Yep, this, this gave me a safer look, exactly what I thought. Now, to export, before I go to export, if you don't have your histogram or navigation on, here at the corner, you can turn off or turn on. Here in this button, you can show or hide adjustment palette. Let me show you. Click, it's gone. Click, it's back. You see that? So this is pretty amazing. Now, once you are done, you want to export it. This is where you click, save images. So you click it. Now you have, look at the size of the image, 58, almost 59 megapixel. Damn, this is big. So you have the source, you have the adjustment mount. Don't worry about it too much, honestly. Uh, just leave it as it is, default. Then output, original size, half size, double size, etc. Depends on your look. And then you have the color space, sRGB, my friend. Always live in sRGB unless you are printing and doing some serious work. Now, generally, typically, you would export as JPEG, but if you want to do any kind of further editing in Photoshop or Light, not Lightroom, Photoshop, Affinity Photo or GIMP, you can, I recommend you to export in 16-bit TIFF. In this case, I'm not doing it. Then you have the quality. So, of course, you want to export the highest quality so that when you upload in Facebook or Instagram or any kind of web pages, even after the compression, you still have a very good quality image. And then destination, of course, you select your destination and you can 
change the name if you like to. And you can do exactly the same thing with the batch export. Anyway, this is how this software works. If this tutorial useful to you, do like and subscribe. Come back to this video so that you can practice over and over again. I wish you all the best. See you next time. Bye-bye.